Let me make sure the sound is all good for you. One of the first questions I remember asking, which is, what else is out there? And I would look out my childhood window at the little patch of the sky. And There's I nothing. There's nothing out there. We're all alone. We only got each other. I'm kidding. I hope there's... I hope it's full of life because it would be an awful waste of space, wouldn't it? Just remember what they were and what else was out there. And I remember having this feeling almost of restlessness. <laughs> I agree. In 1823, German astronomer Heinrich Olbers looked up at the night sky and saw darkness. Ooh, he... starting off with Olbers Paradox, are we? This is a cool one. Wondered if the universe were infinite and eternally static, then... Sure. I remember being, th th someone threw this at my face when I started my physics degree in an astrophysics class. The professor just threw it at me and I'm like, what do you mean? Like it, it was, it was, it's quite a like mind breaking thought experiment. Shouldn't the night sky shine with a light of infinite stars, a dazzling, brilliant sky. Olber's paradox was so compelling that many considered it proof of a finite universe. A cosmos that, at some point, simply ends. It wasn't until a century later when Edwin Hubble observationally established the reality of an expanding universe that finally Olber's paradox was firmly solved. You see, Olber's second assumption was wrong. The universe is not static. But what does modern astronomy have to say about the size of the universe, though? Is it finite? And if so, does that mean there's an edge, a boundary? Or could it be infinite? An endless ocean of space with challenging philosophical consequences, if so. Join us today as we tackle this question, one of the grandest of scales. Very dramatic tone to his voice in this one. How big is the universe? He's so good looking. Kind of question that a child might ask when they first encounter the concept of space. And yet, it is one which continues to perplex and even haunt astronomers today. It's often said that astronomy is a humbling experience. For whilst... Earth Quote, Carl Sagan. Early thinking considered the Earth, the Sun, the Moon to be the de facto universe, our modern understanding establishes one which is unimaginably larger. At each stage in science's journey of revelation, humanity has had to swallow another pill of great demotion, being quietly ushered down. Okay, hopefully this is um his video and not mine that's kind of lagging here. To an ever lower seat in the great cosmic hierarchy. These demotions began in the 16th yeah, century when Copernicus, Kepler, and Galileo challenged the geocentric view of their time, revealing that the Earth is just another planet. The horizon of the observable universe has a special name, the particle horizon. Everything in the observable universe must lie within that boundary. Now, the visible universe is subtly different from this. In the first few hundred... Now, this is going to be very confusing. It's, this is all very confusing. And the only real way to understand our sort of current image of what he's talking about is to piece together a lot of different things. Okay, so there's a clue because a lot of people sort of struggle with this. Everyone, I did when I come into it, in understanding what the hell he was just talking about. Basically... You know, if you're confused, so we're at 738, if you're confused by this whole observable universe thing, you're like, hey, what do you mean there could be more universe beyond the area where, you know, that's because that's the age, the universe isn't old enough. It's like, it doesn't seem to make sense, right? It's because you got to remember how the universe we think started. And there's two things, really, you should keep in mind. Dark energy, right? We think, um, we don't think there's experimental evidence where it looks really like the universe is expanding, right? Uh, and it's not just ex just expanding at a you know certain rate; it's accelerating in its expansion. And uh, this has changed over the course of the universe. Um, but so the further you are away, the older. Uh, and because the, the expansion rate is increasing, right? The faster. Do you see? It gets confusing. So there are now places in the universe that are expanding away from us faster than the speed of light. And so we'll never be able to cross that gap with our current understanding of physics because you have a region that's kind of growing 
in between the you know the two sort of light sources faster than the speed of the light, right? Um, so that's a problem. We'll never be able to get there unless we there's a more physics that we don't know about. And then the other thing that you got to remember is the cosmic inflation period, which um, you know if our Big Bang model is going to make sense, this kind of has to be a thing because cosmic inflation happened just before the Big Bang, which many people get wrong. But this whole period of time in the early universe, there's multiple uh, hypotheses and ways of looking at it. And, you know, we don't really know which one's correct. There's just sort of scientific consensus. There's lots of different scientists who think this and this and this. But the, the sort of most accepted one, the consensus is that cosmic inflation happened just before the Big Bang and the universe rapidly, like, inflated in size. Um, there's a lot you could say here, right? But we don't know if the inflation, that if that inflation stopped, right? It could have just continued. And so the universe could be way, 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 way bigger than our little observable region. And why we say this? Well, because the universe grew from, you know, the, in this cosmic inflation period, from a point to another point, the, the proportion that it grew is actually equivalent to the to the, the ratio that it grew from then to now, right? 13.7 billion years later, yeah? Like how much bigger the universe is, it's a lot bigger. But that, that is completely comparable to the, the amount it proportionally grew at that very early point. Do you see? <laughs> like it was very quick, uh, much faster than the speed of light. And so a lot of people think, well, what happens if that just actually continued beyond the observable uh, horizon? Do you see? So, um, yeah, keep those two things in mind. And that kind of helps you understand why people often say there might be more universe beyond the observable universe. Uh, and pretty much everyone that I've talked to kind of thinks that as well. Uh, it's, it's a really common opinion because this is an opinion, right? This, this, at the, that point, we don't know if there is more. But a lot of people, if you actually ask them in astrophysics, like just on the street, they, we all kind of think it's probably like infinite in size the particle horizon not everyone don't get me wrong and i'm not saying that's like a fact or anything that's just a complete opinion and so the bulk of the universe wasn't transparent it was opaque it was only when the universe cooled enough for atoms to form that the fog cleared away in an epoch known as recombination finally allowing light to travel freely so because of this the visible universe is a little bit smaller than the observable one but still one incredibly large the observable universe Ooh. is mind-bogglingly big. No words or analogies can really do justice to just how preposterously, frankly, unreasonably large it is. When trying to imagine the enormity of it, one has a sense that our awe only skirts the very fringes of its true wonder. And that if we ever did comprehend yeah, you're not allowed to work and do a PhD in most places, period. Though. Like, you actually have a limit to how much time you, they let you work. <laughs> uh, because you're doing a full-time job, man. Like, in Europe and a lot of places, PhDs are treated as a job. And it is a job in every sense of the word. You're doing that. You're on the frontier of science, right? Professors do fuck all. Like, they actually just leech off PhDs. PhDs and the work they do is the most significant work they'll do in their life. Uh, and that's the front line of science, right? And the system, the whole academic system right now is flawed and fucked. Um, you get these professors churning out three to four papers a year simply because it's their students' papers and they get their name on it. And so they're not really doing much, right? And I'm, I know I sound quite cynical, pessimistic about it because it's not in a good situation and there needs to be improvements. And if no one talks up, it won't improve, right? And a lot of people in the system still can't speak up because they'll get thrown out. So now I'm an outsider, I can sort of voice some of these concerns a bit more for the sake of the people currently in the PhD systems. Because it's, it's really not a good situation. Just wondering if there was any other reason. Yeah, I have a passion for both, so I figured, why not? It's very costly. I've been wondering if the PhD is worth it. Yeah, I, I think if you, you know, if you go along with the, is it worth it? Um, probably not. Like it kind of needs to be a, you know, there's no question about it sort of thing. It's not a matter of worth. It's a matter of like what you want to do with your little brief moment in the sun, right? And I don't, there's nothing more honorable and noble in my opinion, Ninja, than adding to the tree of knowledge for humans. So, uh, you know, I think you're doing one of the most important things 
someone can do for humanity and um like if that matters to you what more worth could you provide right and it's volume we might never come back like falling from a great height yet we are compelled to ask could it be even bigger take the observable universe corresponding to a distance 45 billion light years away now usually at this point videos like this take that number and double it so 90 billion light years and they would call that the diameter of the observable universe we have to be a little bit careful about that though because what if one day we discover another gnz11 galaxy in the opposite direction to where we found the first and i don't just mean a galaxy which is similar to gnz11 i mean a galaxy which is identical identical. Well, that would imply that the universe somehow wraps around on itself, kind of like walking the surface of the spherical Earth. And so the non-repeating plane of the universe, what we might call the fundamental plane, would have to be necessarily smaller than this 90 billion light year number. So do we actually see any evidence for this? Well, let's return to the moment of recombination in the early universe. This is the oldest, most ancient light that we can observe, and it comes from all directions. After all, the entire universe was filled with this ionized plasma. This light is known as the Cosmic Microwave Background, or CMB, and it encodes the temperature of the universe at this time. Any patch of the CMB more than two degrees away from another patch is simply too far away to have had time for light to have traveled between them at least given the age of the universe at the time, just 380,000 years old. So if we see a particular pattern or ripple repeated in the CMB that is separated by more than two degrees, well, that implies that space somehow wraps around on itself. And that, in turn, means that the universe might be smaller than we initially thought. Detailed studies of the CMB reveal no such repeating structures though, and this lack of structure can actually be used to put lower limits on the size of the full, unobservable universe, but not surprisingly, these limits essentially correspond to the approximate size of the observable universe, Thanks, 90 billion light years. Another way that we might try to determine the size of the universe is through a logical argument. Suppose that somebody lives in the distant galaxy GNZ11. They will be able to look towards us and see the faint young Milky Way as it is in the process of forming. But they could also look the other direction. Would they see a boundary to the edge of the universe, a physical edge? Whilst we cannot truly know what they might see, a basic assumption. Other galaxies have sick names Andromeda, Magellanic Clouds. Um, there's just too many galaxies to name Kippy Cup. Kimmy Cup. What did I say? That's uh, why there's some have boring names. There's just, you know, when there's two trillion g galaxies in the universe, it's like, oh, geez, I don't even know if there's that many words. <laughs> Astronomy is the so-called cosmological Definitely principle. Not. It's really an extension of the Copernican principle, which states. How do we know that the background radiation is from the early universe? That's a very easy question to answer, FIBA, as in like it's long-winded, but it's not that complicated. And if that's the sort of question you and you're you asking and you want to know, you go study physics, right? Um, you really should. <laughs> it's that we do not live in a special part. Like the, the fact that you've said that, right, there's some basic stuff you're missing. How do we know it's from the early universe? Well, because it's the furthest thing we can see. And what else do you know about the universe? The further you look, the further back in time you're looking simple as that right space and time fundamentally related as you look through space you look through time the further back you look the further back in time you look how do we know how far away it is from there's lots of ways to do this so this is what you call the distance ladder uh, you know we talked about parallax before um, there's a whole range of methods we use to like uh, calculate how far things are away there's big uncertainties in some of them are. but you know, we use them all to communicate. Uh, we, we use them all to like paint a picture of the universe, essentially. Okay. And then from that, we can get a sense. Uh, the cosmic microwave background radiation, you can use something called cosmological redshift. All right. So light gets shifted. There's a lot to explain here if you want to understand it. It gets shifted 
as it travels through the universe because the universe is expanding. So as the universe expands, it stretches the wavelengths as they travel through it. We can look at how much this redshift has occurred. How can we do that? You can look at elements, right? That um, you can look at the uh, you can only look at the light. That's all we've had for a long time. Now we have gravitational wave detectors. But you look at the light, right? And sometimes this light has passed through other elements, uh, and then you know, so there's stuff missing in the light. You know, it's passed through these elements, and these we know because it's missing these certain lines. So it must have passed through some of these elements, right? And so we know where these lines are for this spectrum. And so depending on how much these lines have all been shifted, we're like, hey, look at the redshift, it's that much. We can then calculate via some mathematics that we know how that works, that how much red like this redshift corresponds to this distance. It's all connected, right? Like when you start in science early and they're talking about spectrums and spectra, that might be all kind of boring to some people, all right? But it's not boring when you realize what you're doing, when you realize what it really is, because they don't really tell you early on. Pretty much all of astrophysics uses, experimentally, spectra to break down the light and see what the universe is doing. Like, we only ever had light for a long time, and so we use the spectra of light, uh, you know, absorption and emission spectra, um, to determine pretty much everything. <laughs> Uh, it's also connected. It's beautiful. And, you know, this stuff might sound really complicated. If I, I might sound really smart right now, but I'm not. I'm not any smarter than any of you, I don't think. And I think if you go study this stuff, you know, you'll learn all these different concepts and eventually, you know, like, oh, you're like, oh, it's all starting to connect. And then um, it, everything becomes a bit clearer. And then you meet people who don't have never studied this stuff. And, you know, it's, the universe is really confusing for them because they're missing all these concepts. So if you want to do this, you can. It is not that hard.